We've already talked about bomb calorimetry or constant volume calorimetry, which is what you've done with your peanut lab. The following lab, our Hess's Law lab, is going to be working off of a constant pressure calorimeter, uh, which is also called the coffee cup calorimeter since it's a very, very fancy uh, situation. We have two styrofoam cups uh, stacked into each other. Mm. So looking at the equations of what we're looking here, we're calorimetry, so we're looking at the transfer of heat. We're trying to measure that from our reaction. So Q of our system, of our entire system over here, which we have our two styrofoam cups. We have a lid of some sort. We have a temperature, or excuse me, a thermometer in there to measure temperature and some sort of contraption to stir our solutions. Okay, that, that entire... Uh, system there is going to be equal to the heat from the water in our solution, the heat from our calorimeter components, and the Q of our reaction. Now just like before we're going to assume that we aren't exchanging any heat uh, with our surroundings, so what that means is the Q of our system is going to be zero. Okay. So no, no heat is actually leaving the system. Again, it's an assumption and <clears throat> not always correct, but in a perfect world we'd be able to contain all of the heat from the reaction within our styrofoam container. So our Q of our system is equal to zero. So we rearrange just like we did for the bomb calorimetry and we find that Q of our reaction is the negative sum of Q of water and Q of our calorimeter. So Q of the water is going to be based on the specific heat of water, so mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the change in temperature. And then Q of our calorimeter is going to be the heat capacity of all of its components, so the heat capacity of the calorimeter, times delta T. And we're actually going to make an assumption when we're working with this, the coffee cup, the stu two styrofoam containers, we're going to assume that they actually don't absorb any heat. So that would mean that QCal is equal to zero. And we're going to assume this. So assume. So what that means then is Q of our reaction is equal to the negative Q of the water. And then because we are at constant pressure then, Q of our reaction is in fact equal to delta H of the reaction. So let's work through an example using this concept. And we're told if 135 milliliters of 0 0.450 molar hydrogen iodide at 23.15 degrees Celsius. We're mixing that with 145 milliliters of 0 0.500 molar sodium hydroxide at that same temperature. What is the maximum temperature reached by the solution? And we're going to assume the density and specific heat of all the solutions is the same as for those of water. Okay, so in particular, we have the density of water we're going to assume is one gram per milliliter. And then the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We're given our neutralization equation here. We have an acid plus a base forming a salt and water. Okay, so it is a neutralization equation here. And we have a delta H value of negative 56.14 kilojoules per mole. So does this make it exothermic or endothermic reaction? 
Hopefully you've determined exothermic from that negative value. So heat is going to come off of this equation. So heat is going to be a result of this equation. So what's happening is that when we mix our two solutions, okay, these mix together producing water, which is already there, so just producing more water, and our sodium iodide, which is soluble, so it's aqueous. So this combination is going to release heat. Then our surroundings, okay, our, our water that's surrounding this solution, which is a little weird because our two solutions are made of water, but the heat from the reaction is going to go into the water, and it's going to raise the temperature of our water. And we know we're going to start at 23.15 degrees Celsius, but we don't know where we're going to end. That's what we're trying to figure out. So first of all, we have to figure out how much energy is our reaction going to produce. So we've been given two different volumes. We have 135 milliliters of this solution here. And we have 145 milliliters of our sodium hydroxide solution. So we have two different amounts of our reactants. If we have two different amounts of our reactants, we first have to figure out what our limiting reactant is. So step one, what we're gonna be determining is how much energy so how much heat is the reaction producing? Or, kind of we can ask it a different way, is how many kilojoules of heat are given off. So in order to answer this question, we have two amounts oops, of reactants. So we have to determine our limiting reactant. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to first figure out uh, how many moles of my hydrogen iodide I have present. Use the stoichiometry to convert that to how many moles of sodium iodide can be produced. And I'll do that same calculation with my other solution here, and we'll figure out how many moles of NaI we can actually produce. So we start with our 135 milliliters of our HI solution. We want to go from milliliters to moles of HI. We're going to do that by using the molarity. I have 0 0.450 moles per 1,000 milliliters. Then use stoichiometry to go from moles of HI to moles of NaOH or NaI, excuse me. And just so happens to be a one to one ratio. I'm going to do the same setup with my 145 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. I want to figure out how many moles of sodium iodide I can produce. So we want to convert from milliliters of NaOH to moles of NaOH using the molarity of it. We have 0 0.500 moles per 1,000 milliliters. I want to go from moles of sodium hydroxide to moles of sodium iodide. 
and that is a one-to-one -one ratio. So plug these values into our calculator. So if I completely react all of my hydrogen iodide solution, I have the potential of producing 0 0.0608 moles of sodium iodide. If I completely react all of my sodium hydroxide, I can produce 0 0.0725 moles of sodium iodide. So since this is the lower amount, the most product I can form is the 0 0.0608 moles of sodium iodide. Okay, so the hydrogen iodide becomes my limiting reactant. So some of you might be thinking, hey, I can make more out of my sodium, uh, reacting all of the sodium hydroxide. I can make more of the sodium iodide. So theoretical yield should be the maximum amount of product that I can form. But if you remember our cookie analogy, just because we have, say, you know, 10 pounds of flour and we can make, I don't know, 20 dozen cookies from that much flour, if we only have one stick of butter, we can only make one or two dozen cookies. So in fact, when we do the calculation this way, our theoretical yield is the lower number because we're gonna run out of the other before we can make this larger amount. All right, so from our limiting reactant equation, from our calculation here, we know we're gonna produce 0 0.0608 moles of sodium iodide. And we know for every one mole of sodium iodide that's formed, we're going to produce 56.14 kilojoules. So we're going to take our value here of our 0 0.068 moles. We're going to use our delta H value and stoichiometry and that we know for every one mole of sodium iodide that's produced, we're going to get 56.14 kilojoules. We have 3.41 kilojoules that's going to be given off by our solution. So our reaction itself is going to produce 3.41 kilojoules of energy. So our second component or a second part of this question is to figure out how much our temperature is going to increase. So our water is going to absorb the 3.41 kilojoules of energy. We're going to use the specific heat of water to figure out how much that temperature is going to increase by. So if the water absorbs the 3.41 kilojoules of heat, what is the final temperature? 
So we're looking at the Q of the water is equal to the mass of the water, the specific heat of water, times the change in temperature. So we're interested in this change in temperature. So our change in temp is equal to the Q of our water divided by the mass of the water times the specific heat of water. So our Q of water is going to be our 3.41 kilojoules. That's the amount of energy that the water is going to absorb. Now our mass of the water is going to come from the mass of our two solutions. Okay? And we know that we have 135 milliliters, right? And we're adding 145 milliliters. And when the question tells us that we're going to assume that the density is the same for water as for our solutions, what that means is we're, that we're assuming that this means 135 grams, and this means 145 grams. So we have, what, 270, 80? So 280 grams of water times the specific heat of water, 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Be careful with your units. We have kilojoules up top, joules down on the bottom. So we want to convert these. We need kilojoules in the bottom, joules up top. We have a thousand joules for every kilojoule. So my change in temperature ends up being 2.91 degrees Celsius. So no, I know that my temperature is going to increase by this much. So my delta T is my T final minus T initial. We know T initial, that's the 23.15 degrees Celsius. My delta T is the 2.91 degrees Celsius. So we're solving for T final, which is going to be delta T plus T initial, or 2.91 degrees Celsius plus 23.15 degrees Celsius. So my final, my maximum temperature reached by the solution is going to be 26.06 degrees Celsius. So we're going to get some practice of working these types of calculations next week in Hess's Law Lab, where you're going to be um, mixing solutions together, measuring the final temperature, um, and using that actually in conjunction with Hess's law, which will be in uh, the next video.